I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community. I have the pleasure of talking with a very special guest today, Dr. Bethany Michelle, a registered psychologist who specializes in children and adolescents with suicidal and self-harm behaviors. Dr. Michelle practices and teaches in Vancouver, British Columbia. Bethany also happens to be my daughter. (laughs) She maintains that she's my favorite, which of course she is, as she is also my only. So this chat is especially enjoyable for me. Welcome to the show, Bethany. Thank you very much. I'm very, very happy to be here. I have spent so many years coming back here around Christmas time, and it's nice to be able to offer something back to the community. And it's really such a pleasure to be recording and look across the screen and see my daughter. I mean, that's that's kind of an amazing thing that doesn't happen for all of us. So, and I hope this is like the first of a series. I would love that. Yeah, because I I, I think you have amazing information for people who are struggling with their own kids, or you know, perhaps another member of their extended Mm -hmm. family. yeah, it it can it can get really rough. So yeah, and I'm going to say that I know that both professionally and personally, as I have my own 13 year old who is a very emotionally intense kid, uh, and his mother, strangely, is also emotionally intense. And so there's I that. I seem to, to remember with. there was a year between <laughs> the ages of 12 and 13 when you actually didn't speak to me. No, I was not speaking to you. Yeah, yeah, my kid is not there yet, but I, I'm looking. Next couple of years, we're going to Well, it's there. probably because he's a boy. Exactly. And girls have a tendency to yep. do that whole maturity thing a it's little true. bit he's faster. He's a little bit later. Yeah. 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 He's a cutie, though. He is <laughs> darn cute. He looks just like us. Adorable. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right. So, Dr. Michelle, I can't believe I actually get to call you. <laughs> do I call you Candace? Uh, you can call me whatever you want, just not late for dinner. Can I, uh-huh. Call you mom? No, that's weird. You can call me mom. mom. I don't care. Mom. I know, right? Okay, mom. Ma. Um, so tell us a, a little bit about you. What you know? What are your credentials? Sure, sure, sure. School. You know. Um, so, so I'm a, I'm a, as you said, I'm a registered psychologist, um, and that means that I have a PhD, and so I've gone through a very extensive uh, training process. Um, I did my graduate work at Harvard University. I did my um, pre-doctoral uh, internship at Brown University. And then since then, I moved to Vancouver. I'm actually from the States, as you know. Um, so I'm American. Uh, but we've been living in Vancouver with my family for a number of years now, 13 years, actually, almost 14 years. And uh, we moved to Vancouver. Uh, I started teaching at the University of British Columbia. And so, Which, by the way, I just want to say I have my my hoodie <laughs> yes, that do. I'm wearing today. I love is it. Is a UBC one. UBC, yeah, yeah. all the way. Continue on. Um, <laughs> uh, God, I, I can't even. Go Thunderbirds. Go Thunderbirds. Here go, you go Thunderbirds? We're the Thunderbirds, apparently. Wow. I know. I okay. Know. Um, so, UBC. yeah. So I, so I teach at UBC. I teach an uh, undergrad. I teach in the Department of Psychology. I also teach graduate courses. So I teach um, treatment, psychological treatment for children and adolescents in both the clinical psychology uh, graduate department. So that's for PhD students, kids who are coming up. I call them kids, but, you know, young adults who are coming through their education, getting their PhDs. Uh, And as of January, I'm going to start teaching in the school and applied psychology department as well, teaching their folks uh, how to do treatment with children and adolescents. So what what is applied psychology? Uh, It's basically, so that's within the school of education. So I teach within the school, uh, the Department of Psychology and the Department of Education. And in education, people are focusing on training mostly around younger kids. And so children and adolescents, but more school age, um, they're training to become school psychologists, meaning that they can work in the school system as a a school psychologist. Um, They're also doing a lot of assessment work to figure out how to do basically psychoeducational assessments figuring out um, you know, if there's issues like ADHD, if there's issues like dyslexia, any learning disorders. So they're learning a lot about that. In addition, though, they do get some training in how to do counseling, basically, with children and adolescents. And so there are a number of uh, different courses that are offered to them. And so I'm going to be teaching one of those courses. So if somebody is in the school system as a school psychologist, are they 
are they doing something different than a guidance counselor, for instance? Not necessarily. They can. It's sort of, um, it's, it's basically what the school needs. And so if the school, most schools don't have a lot of funding, they don't have a lot of resources. And so you basically have one person who's in that position, who is the guidance counselor, school psychologist, and they're doing everything. A lot of school systems don't have a, a guidance counselor or a, or a school psychologist who can even stay there five days a week. And so you're often sharing people in wow. between schools. Mm -hmm. And so they're really just doing the basic, basic stuff that they need to do, looking at folks who are neurodivergent and do they need different resources, um, setting up like, is there a speech therapy that needs to happen? If that's even a resource. Again, right. our school systems are really hurting for resources. And so we don't have enough of that. Um, do you do you have the the sense that Canadian uh, school systems are struggling as well? Very, very much so. Very much so. We the the school that my son went to um, in the primary school, I think they had somebody come for two hours a week. Oh, who was the the guidance counselor, or school dear. psychologist? Yeah, it was not. Uh, it was not good. It was not super helpful. And so many kids, because I'm a psychologist. And I was very involved in the school, right? He's my one and only child. I was, I was involved. Um, I would get to know the other parents and they would talk to me about what was going on with their kids. And you would just see the rampant amount of anxiety, um, burgeoning depression, the kind of psychological issues that are just starting to build that's not on anybody's radar, unfortunately. And so I don't know if that would be better if we had more school psychologists in place. Um, it might, it might not, but still you have so many kids and so many of them could really use some help. And I would assume that while it might be apparent, some children's issues might be pretty apparent. I would think that some kids wouldn't be. That no. And in fact, so one of the things that I did a lot and I still do is I will give talks in the community for um, parents and for teachers on child anxiety. And so one of the things that we find is that child anxiety, we sort of call it like a gateway disorder. It's the disorder that usually starts first. Mm -hmm. And it's something that you see very easily, very recognizably. A lot of times people are like, oh, they're fine. You know, suck it up, buttercup. You know, you'll be okay. If they can't just suck it up, buttercup. If they can, great, wonderful, you're, you're golden. If they can't, which a lot of folks can't, they really need some kind of guidance about how to approach their anxiety. Because anxiety comes from temperament. Temperament comes from genes. And so basically, you are born with a certain level of anxiety or, mm. or a likelihood of becoming anxious. And so if you have a higher level of becoming anxious, likelihood of becoming anxious, you're going to feel anxiety in response to things. Mm -hmm. And again, like a lot of kids are overlooked, especially the anxious ones who are quiet because a lot of times you see anxious kids who you think, oh, this kid is just shy. They're quiet. They're reserved. And so they're no trouble, right? right? So they don't really get noticed by the teachers. And so nobody's picking them out as this kid really needs extra attention until it gets to the point when kids are not willing to go to school or they're not speaking. They, they've developed mutism is what we call it. Um, oh so they word. won't speak to anyone. Wow. And so it gets pretty extreme before anxiety really gets noticed. Mm -hmm which is unfortunate because, again, for a lot of these kids, it doesn't just, number one, it doesn't go away because this is temperament and this is the way they're going to respond to things until they know a different way to respond. Number two, it tends to often, for kids who are at risk, which is many, many, many kids, lead to depression in uh, early adolescence. And once you have the anxiety and the depression, that becomes a little bit of a, a storm that can mm. turn into a lot of rough stuff for kids. So, and and I'm probably getting ahead of us at this mm. a point, of course. But but what that what so what comes to my brain is um, th that there there are some mental disorders that start presenting in late teens and early twenties. I'm assuming that gateway existed for them as well? Oh, for a long, long time. It's rare that we see something pop up in your late teens, early 20s. 
where there I'm was thinking no like schizophrenia or you okay, know, so the, stuff those like are like the more serious disorders. So mm-hmm. there, there's a couple of disorders that we call serious mental illness or severe mental illness. Um, those are schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Mm-hmm. Those are highly, highly, highly genetic. There is some environmental piece, but they are highly genetic. Okay, uh, and so you aren't really going to see those for the most part. You're right until young adulthood, mm-hmm. and that's when the stressors kick enough into place, just the developing brain is a stressing event itself, Mm -hmm. the development, that it kicks enough into place that kids now have developed the disorder. The 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 sort of more typical disorders that we look at generally, the anxieties, the depression, um, the the kind of behaviors that uh that I tend to work with, which is kids with severe emotional dysregulation, kids who are um, even reaching out to to think about suicide, who are engaging in self harm, um, substance use, all of that stuff is in a, a slightly different category mm-hmm. to our severe mental illness, and those are much more they're much more malleable, so uh, they're much easier to prevent and to treat, and to treat in a way uh, with um, basically like talk therapy, essentially, okay. rather than just medication. For bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, you absolutely need medication. There is no way around it. Um, and without it, it's just going to get worse. Okay. And, and ADHD, that ADHD is autism. The so, right. So those are, those are our neurodivergent. I don't even like to call them disorders, honestly, because they're just a different brain formation, right? They're, they're just neurodivergence. So and basically, so, when you say neurodivergent, mm-hmm. what that means is that there's this kind of spectrum that your that the human brain can mm-hmm. be on, mm-hmm. and we're not all on the same place on the spectrum. No, yeah, not at all. So basically, the 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 neural development that's underlying things like um, ADHD uh, and autism, for instance is really in place as the baby is developing in the womb. Like that's already no there. No way. There. It's there. It's there. It's there. Like that's just there. That's just how their little wiring, how their little brains got wired up. Wow. And it's done. And wow. so again, there's nothing wrong with that kind of wiring. Right. It's, it, <laughs> the problem with it is that it doesn't really fit into the way our society is set up. And so our society is really set up for what we call neurotypical or like your regular, regularly wired brain. Right. That's what it's set up for. That's who can succeed. That's, you know, that's who it's for. That's who set it up. That's who it's for. Um, the neurodivergent kids, it's much harder for them to navigate their way through, to find what works for them and to essentially not get in trouble for being the way they are. And there's lots and lots of ways that we can adjust the way we sort of help them through the world, that we can adjust, honestly, like the classroom, uh, the, the social interactions. There's a lot of things that we can do to adjust, to include everybody that isn't too, too painful. One of the things, though, that's going to be important is just remembering they're not intentionally, like your, your tiny little ADHD kid who's bouncing off the walls, that is not intentional, and they wish they weren't doing it. Like they do not want to be doing it either. They just don't know what else to do. They, they, it's like they're sort of crawling out of their skin. They don't know what to do with the energy. That and, must be really uncomfortable for them. And if you think about it, another way of thinking about it for, for us neurotypical folks, um, is that Wait when a minute, you were, or did you just tell you that us that you're, you're typical? I am neurotypical. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. As far as I know. Well, we'll see. Anyway, yeah. I was saying me and the other neurotypical people, not you. I have okay. No idea yeah. You. Leave me out of it. You're out yeah. of this. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so again, I think I'm neurotypical. Yeah. Um, but uh, for neurotypical folks, um, we, when we were two, like if you think about being two years old, mm-hmm. I mean, we can't really remember, but even like five years old, you see someone who has something, you go up, you grab it. You're not thinking like, I'm going to get in trouble for this. I shouldn't do this. This is not morally correct, whatever. You're not thinking about all this stuff because- It's an impulse. It's an impulse. Right. And same Z's for these kids. Same these for these, these kids with ADHD is that's just not developed. They literally don't have certain things. There's certain, um, certain coding, certain levels of development that aren't there in the front of their brains that takes much, much longer. It takes years longer 
for them. Wow. And so we generally think of kids with ADHD as about two to three years behind uh, neurotypical kids in terms of maturity and basic mm-hmm. development. Mm-hmm. And so social skills, social skills, come on. Yeah, there's like the ability to read and some of that doesn't change and some of it does. So some of it's delayed and some of it is really just different. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, they're on little different paths. They're going to see things differently. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that we see about folks who are autistic a lot is that they really, uh, there's a lot, I mean, it depends. Again, there's a spectrum of um, autism symptoms, um, let's say, and you can be in different, you can have different levels of different kinds of symptoms. One of those symptoms is having a difficult time reading the room, right? The the social cues, like what are other people expecting? What's the sort of like unsaid things? Like you don't, you know, in Brookings, I imagine if you walk right up to someone and you're two inches away from their face, that's awkward, Mm -hmm. right? Like Mm -hmm. we don't want that. Mm -hmm. Um, If you don't know that, you might do that and not understand that that's not appropriate. And so there's a whole, like, if you think about it, there's like a whole secret language that neurotypical folks are speaking about what's expected that isn't obvious. And so with folks with autism, it tends to be more helpful to just say it, to just say, can you step back a a foot? So do we learn those? So so Mm -hmm. neurotypical. Yep. Do we learn those things from you know, our parents and people around us and stuff like that. If you're neurotypical, you just learn that. Yeah. That's just part of. Yep. Yep. You learn it and you learn just from watching. Mm -hmm. If you have, again, and you can be autistic and have, you know, high levels of social awareness or Mm -hmm. higher than typical levels of social awareness. um, But folks who are lower on that area of the spectrum are not going to be able to look at a room and watch people long enough and understand what the the sort of not spoken rules are. Mm-hmm. And so it's just confusing for them. Right. It's confusing for neurotypical people because they think, how do you not know this? This is obviously rude. Right. Or like, what are you doing? How am I supposed to interact with you? Right. Again, with folks who have that sort of uh, less sensitivity to those social cues, those subtle social cues, just being really direct tends to be helpful and it isn't considered rude. Whereas to a neurotypical person, they might think that you're rude if you say something absolutely direct. Like it's time to go. Yeah, time to go. Right. Yep. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. Our brains are very, our brains really set us up to have very specific ways of behaving and interacting with each other and the world. And I think that, you know, one of the disservices that we do to Mm -hmm. each other is assuming that we're all neurotypical, right? That we are all exactly the same. And so it it is uncomfortable for mm-hmm. those of us who are neurotypical to be around somebody who's not because we don't know what they're doing. Right, right. And so you can have someone, for instance, let's say a kiddo has ADHD. Um, a kiddo with ADHD can still be a punk. Right? Like you can have a neurotypical punk and you can have a kid with ADHD who's a punk. And so it's not that like they have ADHD, oh, they can't help anything they do. This is just the way they are. We just have to let them do whatever. No, they still have their personality. It's just part of their personality is influenced by ADHD. And so it gets a little tricky to figure out like, is this you being a punk or is this you not being able to process the information, not being able to understand what's expected of you or just forgetting, my God, just forgetting that you can walk from one side of the room to the other and it's gone, right? It's just gone. Well, and sometimes that happens to me. That happens to neurotypical (laughs) people as well. (laughs) I I walk into the kitchen and it's like, what am I doing in the kitchen? Okay, but imagine that this is how your brain always worked, Mm. right? Mm. Like. There's so many things that kids with ADHD have to do to set up their lives to help them remember from one time to another what they need to remember because they're going to forget, they're going to not do the thing, and somebody's going to be mad at them for not doing the thing they said they were going to do Right. and think, how could you possibly forget that? And they they can, they can. Or they could intentionally not forget and just not do it because they're they're being a punk because they don't want to do it. So again... You have to know the individual. You really have to know the individual. And if you have someone in your family with ADHD, you're going to get to know them. You want to sort of open open the, the door for conversation with them to get a sense of like, 
what is hard for you, what's not hard for you, when do you when do you understand what I'm saying and what's confusing for you. The more that they trust you, that you're not going to get mad at them for being the way that they are, the more they are likely to be honest with you and tell you what's up. And that's kind of really an important point because kids typically will tell a parent what they want to hear because they don't want to get in trouble, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that I time after time, that's what kids do. Yep. And you actually don't want that kind of an interaction. No, you want no. a really honest... You want to know what's really going on. Because if you know what's really going on, then you can help them. Mm-hmm. You can't help them if they're giving you, if they're like a yes man, right? Mm-hmm. Like you can't help them if they're telling you what you want to hear because it's not true. Mm-hmm. And so then they end up, it, it does a bad, like, bad thing for them too, a disservice to them because they don't get their needs met. Right. But their immediate need, what they most want in that moment right. is for their parent to love them, care about them, accept them. Right. And so they don't want to say the things that the parent might get mad about. Right. So you really, you want to develop a relationship with your kid where you can talk to them outside of times of conflict. Times of conflict are not time to talk. Like that is nothing good is going to come out of that. That's not the time to talk. When they're emotionally elevated, we call it like emotionally drunk, basically. Mm -hmm. When they are just feeling their emotions, their brain is not really working. And this is true with neurotypical kids, um, neurodivergent kids. It's true with everybody. True Honestly, me. I, was I know say, when it's I'm literally really... true of you. I'm looking at you right now. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's so true. It's mostly you. It's mostly just you, but also everyone else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when we are emotionally activated, when we're having big emotions, we don't think as clearly. And that's literally, that's a biological thing. That's like our brain actually works as a little bit of a seesaw. Mm-hmm. Like our logic brain and our emotion brain mm-hmm. are basically on a seesaw. And so one of the ways you can get yourself, if you're emotionally like, wah, freaking out, to come back down and get a little bit more, a little more logical is really focus on some logical piece of something rather, so that you can just like engage that side again. Interesting. Yeah. So, so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm trying to think of practical applications. Mm-hmm. So, so I have a dear friend who um, just goes ballistic with anxiety and everything oh, else. Yep. That's right? Rough. Yep. So when that when he finds himself in that situation, mm-hmm. the thing to do might be to grab a crossword puzzle. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm trying to come up <laughs> I mean, with something. Sure, I mean, he something could. that's certainly a thing to do. It's certainly there are a lot of things you can do. One of the things that I try um you want to be a little bit careful with just total distraction. Because distraction can be helpful, but it can also be avoidance. And so it depends on what you're anxious about. Mm -hmm. And if you, like, what's going to help you most is to go ahead and do the thing that you're anxious about. Mm. Or if you're better off just, like, not thinking about it. Because if you're just going over something in your head again and again and again Mm -hmm. about, like, oh, God, and this happened and that happened. What what is this person thinking of me? There is nothing good that's coming out of that. Like, nothing. Nothing. Have you ever really figured out as you're going over in your head all of the things you've done wrong, like how to fix the situation? Uh, (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. None of us do. None of us do. This is where we get into the shame spiral. We crawl under the covers. Yes. We put our heads. Sometimes I do forward and backward rolls when I get super, super (laughs) anxious. I don't know. I don't know why. It's just a thing, right? We all have our weird little things. It's interesting. It's fine. Yes. Um, Nonetheless, I'm not thinking clearly, as you can imagine, as I'm rolling forwards and backwards or putting my head under my covers Mm -hmm. or just sort of like crawling away from everyone and pretending I don't exist anymore. Right. That's just like, get away, get away. There's nothing good that's going to happen right. in terms of me thinking things through at that moment. Right. What we need is to basically sort of, it's a little bit like taking hold of our minds, mm-hmm. taking hold of our attention a little bit and just recognizing, okay, in this very moment, is there a threat? And a threat means, is someone about to murder me? Right. Is a bear about to eat me? Right. Uh, Am I about to fall off a cliff? Right. If none of those are true, the likelihood is that in this minute, in this very instance, you are not in danger. If you're not in danger, we want to just bring it down a little bit and just notice, okay, what what is this situation I'm in right now? 
Mm -hmm. And so we can practice. There's a lot of things that you can practice, but this is basically, this is one of the ways that um, in in the the kind of practice or the kind of therapy that I practice. Um, which is? Which is called dialectical behavior therapy. Uh, and so we can get into that. Yeah, um, but I one of the to. one of the pieces of that is mindfulness. It's not the mindfulness like meditation, although I'm all for meditation. Mm. I think that's fantastic. It's really mindfulness, just noticing what you're doing with your mind and doing it on purpose. Mm. And so one of the the exercises that we'll practice is we call it the five, four, three, two, one. And so if you're feeling super, super anxious, you recognize I am not in danger. So my fight flight does not need to be on, right? I can just bring that right on down. We do the five things. You look around, five things you can see, and you oh, take a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that forces your exactly. attention the seesaw. onto real things. The seesaw okay. yeah. Yeah, engages yeah. differently. So five things you can see, mm -hmm. and then four things you can hear. Okay. I always get the order of this wrong, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, three things you can feel. Mm -hmm. Two okay. things you can smell. Mm -hmm. And one thing you can taste. Interesting. And you really walk yourself through it slowly. I've tried to do that with my husband and son before, and they make it a race. That's not the point. <laughs> that's not what you do. They you make it a race. No, you're not. That's not. A, that's, that's I got not, there before you, Dad. That's not how you bring anxiety down. That's not the way. Yeah. <laughs> it might be more fun. It, it's distracting. Yeah. It certainly takes your mind off of whatever you were yes. anxious about. Unless you were anxious about a competition, and then it doesn't. But yeah. uh, just really bringing your mind back to like, in this minute, do I need to do anything? Is anything an emergency? And again, remembering that an emergency is I'm about to die, or someone close to me is about to die, or get seriously, seriously injured. It's not like I'm about to be insulted. Okay, you you can walk away from that. Like, who cares? Right. I mean, I know it's it's rude and it's not fun. Right. But it's not and. Death. Like it's not yeah. death. Like yeah. you're you're gonna be fine. Yeah. Um, it's not, you know, is someone gonna did someone cut me off? Maybe, but like you're fine. Mm -hmm. Unless you are actually in a crash. And then even then, once you're in the crash, the crash is over. Right. And so you're no longer in immediate danger. And so it's just bringing your brain back so that you can control what you do in your life, so that your emotions are not in control of you. Your emotions are super, super valuable, super yeah. important, super useful to understand. They give you a lot of information. The one thing that they they are is that they're a little dramatic. <laughs> they're a little bit into themselves. <laughs> emotions really love themselves. Yes. Yes. And so uh, we don't want to just blindly follow them. Right. We want to take in the information, okay, but I don't have to do the exact thing my emotion wants me to do. If I'm mad because, like, I don't know, someone flipped me off or something like that, I don't have to like yell back at that person. My right. my anger is going to want me to punch them, right? Right, right? But is that actually going to help me? Probably not. No. Right? And so I I have other things to do. So not not super interested in a fist fight there. And so so can a parent help a child yes. with that? Yes. Yes. So one of the like main things kids need to understand is what emotions even are. And like what what these emotions are, how they feel in our bodies mm -hmm. so that kids can recognize them. Because sometimes kids don't even recognize, like they have no idea what they're feeling. Right. And from the outside, you're like, okay, you're obviously angry. Uh, inside, they're like, I don't know. They might be like, I'm scared. Are you though? Or they might look angry and they're actually like, it's a whole different emotion way deep down underneath is that they're sad mm -hmm. and they don't want to be sad. And so their anger takes over. Right. There's a lot of things that can be going on with emotions. So just talking to them about understanding what emotions are and how they feel in our body. And you can just go with like your, your kid. How does it feel like to you? Mm -hmm. You know, there doesn't have to be a right answer. Mm -hmm. We have all sorts of like, you know, information from research and all sorts of things that you can use uh, to teach your kid about emotions. But you can also just ask them, like, when you're really mad, what does it feel like to you? What, what does it feel like in your body? A lot of times they're going to talk about their thoughts. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. That's useful too. Mm -hmm. If you can get them into their bodies, though, that tends to be more helpful at sort of grounding them. Because hmm. thoughts will take you on a oh, trip spiral. out to sea, Absolutely. like you are gone. To the moon if you can and back. get back to your your physical feelings of anger, like mm -hmm. like for you, where do you feel anger in your body? 
It's usually in my solar plexus. Okay. I don't know what that is. But uh, okay. Right there. Nice. Right there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, right there. <laughs> right there. I mean, yeah. And it just, it's like mm-hmm. heat. It's like mm-hmm. this molten heat. Yep. And yep. it spreads out from there. And yep. my entire body is enveloped yes. in heat. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I'm vibrating. I feel like I feel it so much in my wow. punching muscles. <laughs> like I just <laughs> want to rail. I want to rail. My face, my cheeks get really, really hot. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we can do is just notice, okay, for me, that's anger. And so if I'm feeling angry, those are the sensations I'm going to feel. It doesn't mean I have to punch someone. It just means that I'm feeling that. And that's okay. One of the the little sayings that we have is emotions are not emergencies. Ah. And so you can have any sort of emotion. You don't have to get out of it. It's okay Uh to just feel the emotion until it passes. Right. Like, that's okay. Because eventually it will pass. They all pass. Yeah. They all pass. Right. They all pass. It seems like they go on forever. Usually they go on because we keep thinking the things and that re-triggers it. But I, I think, I can't remember what the number is, but in research they've discovered that an emotion, the amount of time an emotion actually lasts is somewhere between... 15 and 180 seconds. Wow. So, and then that's the full emotion and then it's over. Wow. And so like between a few seconds and like a couple minutes, right? Three minutes. Mm -hmm. I can tolerate anything in that time. Like you can be in a lot of pain in that time and that's okay. It will pass. The reason they go on for hours and hours and hours for many of us, because we keep thinking about them. We keep thinking about how someone did us wrong or how we'll never be okay anymore or how I can't believe this person left me. What is my life going to be now? Or right. what's going to, you know, do people hate me now? Do everyone judge me? We're having all of those thoughts and those just keep the emotions going. So as a parent, then, if you're watching your child basically have a meltdown about mm-hmm. something, um, redirecting them to their bodies and mm-hmm. what they're feeling mm-hmm. and getting them to be specific about that, maybe mm-hmm. talk about that. Can help the seesaw move a little right. bit. Can help right. bring their brains back into it a little bit. Mm-hmm. And also just letting them have the emotion. Like recognizing as a parent, one of the things that we want to do as parents is fix our kids. Right? Yes. <laughs> we want to fix the situation. We want to stop the noise because yes. it's really irritating. Oh, my right? word, yes. Or, or it's like really upsetting. Like we don't want our child to be suffering. Okay, well, they're actually, an emotion isn't going to hurt them. They can feel really, really, really sad or scared or angry. It's not going to hurt them. Like they're going to be okay, right? And so if we can just sort of be with them while they're feeling whatever they're feeling mm-hmm. and let them know that like we're not scared of their emotion, mm-hmm. then they don't have to be scared of it. Because I think that makes a big difference. Huge. If a parent is afraid of their child's huge. emotions, that is going to transmit. Makes it, worse. it makes it so much worse. It right? makes the emotions yeah. so, so, so much more intense. Plus, if if you're a child then and you're getting that from your parent, you're going to start doing shame about Absolutely. your emotions. Absolutely. Or you're going to think that the parent is afraid of you now oh. and that you have some sort of power. Right. We see this a lot with kids with these disruptive behavior disorders, mm-hmm. these um, sort of like really aggressive acting out kind of behaviors, is that their parents uh, are clearly afraid of them. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things we're doing in therapy with them is letting them have their big emotion mm-hmm. and not being afraid of them, not taunting them like, what, yeah. what are you going to do? Bring it on. Me? Like, no, like that's, <laughs> yeah. that's just making it worse once Let's again. Let's laugh at them. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, don't do that. Yeah. But really respecting like, yeah, this is a real emotion. You are having a huge reaction to this, right. which right. makes sense in your head somehow. Like it may, may make no sense to me that you're freaking out about the fact that your you know, rubber duck got lost. Right. But to you, I need to believe that it really matters to you. Yes. And so it is that upsetting to you. So for you, it's real. I'm right. not going to say like, oh my God, if you had any idea how hard I had it. Like that's irrelevant. No, exactly. Because your kid is having their reaction to that thing. Let them have it. The thing is a lot of people, a lot of parents will worry okay, but am I going to raise them to be like a wimp? Am I going to raise them to be super like emotional all the time and like touchy-feely and all that? You're actually not. What you're teaching them to do is to respect themselves more, to to take themselves seriously so that they don't have to prove to other people that they need to be taken seriously. If they can take themselves seriously, they don't have to act out in the big ways. 
they don't need the kind of attention that teenagers end up going for, that's super, super negative attention mm -hmm. that doesn't help them, that actually hurts them in the long run. Right. If they can take themselves and their emotions, their reactions to things seriously, and they know that somebody who cares about them also takes it seriously, mm -hmm. doesn't mean you have to like give in to the emotion. They can be angry because they didn't get the ice cream. And no, you don't get the ice cream. But do I feel for you that you're angry? Yeah, of course. Like that sucks. Right. It's really... I, of course you're bummed. It's of course you're sad. It's so disappointing. And, yeah, absolutely. You really wish that you could have it. Yes. And you know, you can't because I said you can't. Right. But yeah, but you know, boy, your emotions sure make sense. Yeah, I the, get it. Yeah. I get it. Children just need to be understood. If they are understood, you can go, there's so many ways you can go with it. Like you can help them navigate so many difficult parts of their lives if they feel like you get it. Or if you don't get it, if you're at least trying. And if you can say, I'm not quite sure I understand, can you tell me more about that? And I, I think most parents probably would like to understand yeah. their children, yeah. right? But that's a big ask sometimes. It is a big ask. It's a big, and I think for parents to also remember, parenting is exhausting. That's not yes. news. That's not news. <laughs> um, it's exhausting. But like- Nice to hear my daughter oh say Oh my that. God. <laughs> I'm just it saying. is exhausting. <laughs> it is exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so just remembering that like you need to be able to take care of yourself as well. And you're going to blow it. Oops, I just messed that up. Uh, you're going to blow it like at least half of the time. Like right. even as you're learning things, you're still going to blow it. That's okay. You want to give yourself a break and be like, I I'm going to come back at this. Right. And like, it's okay that I'm just learning. And you can tell your kid when you make a mistake and be like, oh, yep, totally blew that. Like after the event, like- mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I did not mean to scream at you or, you know, punch a wall or whatever you did. Right. Um, and let them know, like, I wish I hadn't done this. Here's what I'm going to do differently. Mm -hmm. You know, can we, I don't know, go for a walk and talk about what it was that was going on. And that also opens up the space for the child to own their own mm -hmm. stuff that mm -hmm. is not correct. Yep. Yeah. And I have found that for myself a lot uh, that... I, I, so we all have the emotions that tend to like take us over and just push us right over the edge. For me, it's anger. And so I will be able to hold it, hold it, hold it until it gets to a certain point and then I'm gone. And then I'm just like, Wah! usually um, I will have to walk away at that point. Mm -hmm. And if I don't, I'm screaming mm -hmm. and it's not super helpful. No one is like, nothing good is happening at that point. Right. And so one of the things that my kid has learned over time is that. I'm going to come back, that it's not about him, and that oh. I'm going to come back later and say, like, you know what? That was my emotion. I was feeling a lot of intense emotions. I was really angry about blah, blah, blah. Did you contribute to it? Yeah, you did a thing, mm -hmm. and I had a reaction. Mm -hmm. It's not your fault that I had the reaction. And this is even like, let's say the kid, you know, poured spaghetti sauce all over the carpet. Like, did he do that? Yes, he did. He actually didn't do that. But, uh, but let's say he did. If he did that, did he do it? Yeah. Is that an emergency? It's actually not an emergency, right? It it's has really inconvenient. It really sucks. Yes. <laughs> it really sucks. And you don't want him to do it again. Yeah. If you yell at him, it's going to shut the stuff down. Yep. However, if you have a relationship where they know that you're going to come back and be like, yeah, like you made a mistake, you're going to have to fix this. And like, I'm going to help you figure out how to fix this. Again, you can't necessarily fix spaghetti sauce on a rug. Like that. No. That Pretty might much be it. That rug is shot. That rug is shot. Yeah. And maybe like they're going to have to, you know, see if they can go walk dogs to earn some extra money to pay for, you know, whatever, to right. pay for carpet cleaning or, you know, whatever it is. Right. Um, and so there are consequences. Mm -hmm. And the consequences are going to fall on you as a parent. Right. And that is not great. Nonetheless, once it's already happened, once the, the bad thing has happened, there's nowhere to go with that in that moment. And so you want to just like everybody disengage because nothing good's coming out of that moment. Right. You want to disengage to where you can calm down and then you can talk about it because you want your kid to learn not okay to do that. Right. And to figure out what was going on. Like, why, why were you doing that? Right. Because there is a reason. Again, there's something going on mm. that led them to do that. 
And you might not approve of that. You might not be okay with it. I'm definitely not okay with that. Oh, that um, doesn't, right? like, doesn't sound great. Not okay. I mean, just it's, the spaghetti sauce okay alone that. took me no, hours right? to make. Thank you. That was really, <laughs> and it's food for God's sake. And yes, it's delicious. Exactly. So, not cool, man. <laughs> do um, not pour my spaghetti sauce. Do not pour sauce. my spaghetti sauce. No. Nonetheless, once it's poured, yeah. it's over. It's a done deal. It's a done deal. And so that's a time to just take space and then come back and be like, kid, what happened? Yeah. And to figure out what kind of emotion was going on for them. Because usually whatever they do, there's an emotion under it mm -hmm. that's telling them to do something. Mm -hmm. And so maybe they were angry. Maybe they were sad. Maybe they were scared. It could be a lot of things. They might have been angry that you're not paying attention to them. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say that's the case. They're, you know, they, they want more attention. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. That's great to know yeah. that that's what they need. They're going to need to ask for it in a way that doesn't involve spilling spaghetti sauce everywhere. And if they spill spaghetti sauce everywhere, they're not going to get the attention in that moment. Right. And you can say, like, we're going to work on figuring out how to help you communicate when you need attention. And sometimes I'm not going to be able to give it to you. Right. You know? And in those moments, you're going to let me know. And maybe I'm going to give you, like, I'm going to quickly, like, write down a little coupon that says, you know, 10 minutes of mommy time, you know, in three hours. Right. And then they have that and they know that they will get it. And so now there's no need to do the thing that they did. All right. So can we talk about DBT? Because I really, <laughs> oh, goodness, and the time is just yeah. screaming by. I ended up just talking a lot about well, a lot and, of things. And I, I like, I, you know, that's what I like to do with my guests yeah. anyway, is just yep. chat. Mm -hmm. um, and I always learn so much. Yeah. But, but DBT sounds like a really interesting, what do you call it, modality? Treatment? Treatment. Yeah, okay. I'll just call it a treatment. Okay. So DBT, so if you... Tell me the name of it again. Yeah. Well, I'm going to first tell you CBT. Okay. So okay. there's cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay. This is the, the kind of treatment that is most supported by research, but that most people um, will be trained in at some point. Um, and so it's what you use for a lot of different disorders, like anxiety. It's great for anxiety. You usually don't need DBT or anything extra for anxiety. It can work for depression. Um, it uh, can work for disruptive behaviors. There's a lot of things it can work for. DBT is called dialectical behavior therapy. Why it's called that, I don't know. It's very complicated and unnecessarily so. Of course. Well, it's Un a scientific really thing, right? Unnecessary. <laughs> It's really, Let's it's make it really people, hard to understand. People who have doctorate degrees who are going a little bit, like they're really getting into the theory, right? <laughs> like, all right, bring it back, bring it back, bring yeah. it back. Bring so it we back just call it DBT. Us. DBT yeah. is good enough. Um, but what it is, it's basically a therapy that was uh, designed for people who were suicidal. And oh. so people who wanted to die. Yeah. And so since then, it has, and it's been around for decades, it has been expanded to treat a lot of different kinds of disorders. And um, a lot of people will say uh, DBT, oh, that goes with uh, borderline personality disorder, mm -hmm. which is a very specific cluster of symptoms mm -hmm. um, that is like highly emotional, a lot of like hots and colds in relationship, a lot of impulsive behavior that ends up hurting the person, a lot of feeling out of control in relationships with themselves, with their emotions, just emotions all over the place. Um, and so it really works for those folks too. What we have found, so most of us, at least in the center that I practice in, um, none of us that I am aware of have borderline personality disorder. Um, none of us are actively suicidal, right? But it really, really, the principles are super effective for like everybody. They're oh. kind of really, really effective for everybody. And so it's a, it's a more complicated kind of treatment, but it's basically, emotion driven. So it's all about emotions and how you manage your emotions. And there's all sorts of ways of dealing with your emotions. What we find for the most part with suicide, for instance, is that folks are looking to not feel their emotion anymore. They're mm. looking to escape for the, from the intensity of the emotion. Mm -hmm. And so suicide is the only solution they can think of. And so in DBT, we're saying like suicide isn't, uh, isn't uh, the problem to solve. There's a problem to solve. Suicide is the solution that they came up with to solve the problem. It's just not a good one. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's just not a solution that's going to work, right? Mm -hmm. And so really the problem is whatever the problem is. Mm -hmm. And it could be, you know, they don't have friends. It could be they're being bullied. It could be, you know, 
they're experiencing some kind of sort of like abusive relationships at home. There could be a lot of stuff going on. Um, and what DBT is going to help you do is basically recognize the emotion and manage the emotion in a different way, in a mm. way that doesn't hurt you. Mm. And so it's the same thing for self-harm. A lot of kids will engage in like cutting or self-burning, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They usually do it so they can stop feeling some super intense emotion. Mm. And there's other ways to get through those super intense emotions. What we know is that hurting yourself increases your risk for suicide later. Mm. And it's just not very nice. Mm. Like if you were mad at your friend, actually, no, if your friend was really sad or scared, you wouldn't go burn them or cut them, right? right. That's rude. Right. Yeah. So you wouldn't do that. It's rude. It's rude. Yeah. And so like, it's not okay to do that to yourself either. Right. Like take yourself seriously mm -hmm. and be kinder because you are important. I think kids don't know. I mean, uh, and a lot of people don't know how to manage their well, emotions. Well, no, of course not. We don't learn. Like, no. No one teaches us. No. You're, we're just flying in the wind, just yep. like freaking out. Yeah. And wouldn't you think that drug abuse would also be one of the ways that yeah. they... So so here's what I generally say to a bunch of my clients in DBT. Um, and they come in with like heavy substance use, heavy drug addiction. Some of them are engaged in sex work. Uh, in this like adolescence, right? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's rough. Like 14-year-olds. Yeah. Wow. Um, they are uh, in and out of hospitals, making suicide attempts. They're fully engaging in self-harm just all the time. Um, they're doing a lot of stuff. What we find is that self-harm and drug, ad drug abuse um, or drug use and eating disorder behavior mm. are like the three sort of whack-a-moles. Wow. And it's really easy for kids to go in between them and then the other ones will serve the same purpose. Hmm? Oh, no. We see this a lot. And so you stop the self-harm, they start starving themselves. You stop the starving, they start using meth. Right, oh. like they're doing all of these different things, right. and because you haven't addressed the problem, the issue which is the, is the emotions, they don't know how to manage the emotions, right. and the emotions are super intense, and they need to like be told that yeah, some people's emotions are super, super intense and really hard to manage, and so yeah, you need other ways to manage them, and you don't have them because why would you? Who right. who has taught you this? Nobody. And I remember being a teenager. Yeah. I remember the intensity yeah. of that. Everything was life yeah. and death. Yeah. And Everything. it is. Your, your, your sense of my teenage clients are always like, you know, oh, I don't do that anymore. That was so long ago. I'm like, dude, that was two weeks ago. They're like, yeah. I was a different person then. I'm like, okay, fine. Fine, fine, fine. fine. Yes, you're a different person. But, that, but it seems but it like is a for long, them. Yes. It is for them. And right. you have to just like accept that what they're saying is true for them. Right. Doesn't matter if it seems like, come on, like, oh, you'll grow out of this. Oh, things go better. Oh, who cares about that, you know, boyfriend who dumped you? Well, they care a yeah, lot. A lot. And it does matter. Right. And so they're going to have to deal with these intense emotions. But guess what? Like, okay, that boyfriend is not going to matter to them in 10 years, but other losses they have are going to matter to them. And they still haven't learned how to manage feeling sad or right. feeling scared. Right. And again, I'm going to go way back to where we were at the beginning of the conversation, which was, Really just recognizing your emotion, especially the physical parts if you can, mm -hmm. just noticing them and not being afraid of them mm -hmm. and not trying to get away from them. Mm -hmm. If we can just be in them and just let the emotion be what it is mm -hmm. and recognize that this is not hurting me and I don't have to react to it, I can choose how I respond to it. And so I'm just like, I remember the uh, recently, it wasn't that recent, <laughs> five years ago. <laughs> Yeah. See, when you get older, I go, when you're older, like 10 years ago, it's the same Yeah, person. that was yesterday. It was yesterday. Right? Yeah. yeah. So when you're older. Um, but five years ago, um, my, my precious sweet angel dog, who you were not a fan of, um, died. She was a crazy dog, well, She Bethany. was a chihuahua. I know. And angry. She was a very angry she was dog. was very angry. But I loved her for yeah, it. I know. She was you very, did. oh God, she was angry. Yeah. She was such an angry dog. Always angry. So angry. Yes. <laughs> she would bite your dog's face. I know. It was awful. Yes. It was so bad. It was I know. Bad. She poorly behaved and not her train, her owner did not train her. No. Um, and that would be And you. that would be me. <laughs> I did, I did Taking that responsibility. I took no responsibility yes. and I let her be angry. <laughs> or being a bad I let mother. her be angry. No, yeah. I was a terrible dog. But I loved her anyway. Yeah. Anyway, when she died, 
um, I just remember being racked with grief, just so mm -hmm. sad, crying so hard. Mm -hmm. And I remember having the thought, like, I can't handle this. I can't handle this. Mm -hmm. And just recognizing, okay, that's just a thought. It's mm -hmm. not true. Like, mm -hmm. this just is very, very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But again, like going to what's uncomfortable about it? Well, it really hurts in my chest. I feel like I'm being stabbed in my mm -hmm. chest. Well, guess what? I get migraines. I feel like I'm being stabbed in the head. Mm -hmm. I don't have like, do I want to get out of that? Yeah. But I also recognize when you're in it, you're in it. Yeah. And like, you can't actually make it go away. The more freaked out you get about the migraine, the worse it gets. Right. Same as for emotions. The more freaked out you get about the fact that you're having emotions, the worse it's going to get. Hmm. Because now you're putting stuff on top of it. Right. You're trying to shove it down. So if you can just like have the emotion... And it would come in waves, mm -hmm. like my my sorrow, my grief about mm -hmm. sweet jujubean, mm -hmm. sweet angry jujubean, <laughs> uh, would just come in waves, and it would feel very painful, and I would just let it be what it is, and it would go down, and then it would come up, and it would go down, and basically what happens is your emotion will do its own thing. It's 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 the ocean, right? It they're right. waves, right? And they'll come and go, and it will eventually peter out. It'll eventually be flat. So the way, because I think this is, you know, critically mm -hmm. important. I agree. I agree. When you are just overwhelmed yep. by emotion, yep. the first thing to do is to physicalize it. In if terms you can of just sit with like, number one, this is not an emergency. Mm -hmm. Number two, it makes sense that I'm feeling this. Mm -hmm. Like it is okay for me to feel this. And number three, what am I feeling? And mm -hmm. just try and describe to yourself, what does this feel like? Mm -hmm. What is this? And notice thoughts are, these thoughts are just thoughts. Mm -hmm. I'm just feeling it. I'm really feeling it right now. And this is really uncomfortable. This is really painful. Would it help to have a pencil and a piece of paper and start writing things down? It or could. Or you could do it in retrospect, mm -hmm. just like getting to know, it's sort of like getting to know you and your emotional system better. Mm -hmm. Again, it's taking yourself seriously. Right. And not taking your emotions too seriously. Mm -hmm. Like you're taking your experiences seriously and recognizing, yeah, that's a super intense emotion. This sucks. This is so uncomfortable. Right. And it will pass. And it's not passed right now. And it's really uncomfortable. Right. And I don't need to do anything about it. I, yeah, I think that's it. the really important part that mm -hmm. you don't need to do anything nothing about do. it. I mean, not only do you not need to, like nothing else is going to work. Mm -hmm. Again, you can do drugs, but guess what? that like misery that you felt before is still going to be there when you're straight again. Right. Like it's still going to be there. Or you can like go sleep around. It's still going to be there. Right. Like all that stuff is still going to be there. So all of the things that you do to cope with it that are not helping you don't actually help you process things and get through them. They right. just leave you sort of stuck. And then you have more things on top of it that have made you miserable. Which is really not where you want to no, be. No. And so again, if we go back to kids and parenting, what we want to do is help them recognize it's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not scared of your emotion. It's okay for you to feel this emotion. Mm -hmm. Totally fine. You don't have to do anything about it. And like, yeah, really tell them, you know, number one, I fully get it. It totally makes sense that you would feel this way. Mm -hmm. You know, your rubber ducky is two feet away from you and you can't reach it. You know, again, like a ridiculous situation to adults, mm -hmm. but maybe a kid is freaking out about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like, let them, mm -hmm. let them be super upset about it. Really, they're probably going to figure it out for themselves. Mm -hmm. Like once the emotion comes down, they're going to go figure out how to get it. Right. In the meantime, you don't have to solve it for them. You can just comfort them. Just like, yeah, this sucks. Like it is way, it's two feet away from you. You are so sad that you don't have it in your hand. I mean, in your brain, you're going to be going like, are you kidding me, kid? Are I know, you right? actually kidding Inside, me? Inside, you're like, And that's okay. I, right. You just remember like for them, it's real. It yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. For them, it's real. And me acknowledging it, doesn't make them like weaker. Right. It makes them go, yeah, my emotions actually matter. That's telling me something. Right. It lets them get over the emotion and through it faster so that they can go solve it. Because, you know, it, emotions are not bad things. At all. Right. They're just often very uncomfortable. Right. But but sometimes like you might feel an emotion when you are in danger. Yes. You so you don't want to be taught to disregard your emotions. No, 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 no. If no, you no. are, if, you know, the whole stranger danger thing, yep. right? The van with no windows and <laughs> what is that? <laughs> it's really, it's kind Ice of, cream and puppies, yeah. Ice cream and puppies yeah. and vans yeah. with no windows, yeah. yeah. Places you and, absolutely and don't want. Though you don't want 
no, your the, child. You want your child to have an emotional reaction yep. about something like yep. that. Yeah. So, yep. right. Exactly. To recognize it and then, and not be so driven by it that they can't think. You want right. them to be able to think on top of their emotion. Right. And like recognize, okay, I just felt a really intense emotion. What does that mean? Like, what's the situation? Right. I and at that point, it is fight run. or flight. Yeah. Right? Run. Right. Run, yes. kid. Yeah. Run and scream. So being able to differentiate yeah. between what is likely a, a, a death situation, what yeah. isn't, is yeah. really important. Really important. Really important. Yeah. It's just, it's just fascinating because, you know, I, I used to say that there's no, we don't get a manual I wish we did. as a, when we're born, right? And, and when, when we, we have one. children, yep. we don't get a manual nope. that explains, yep. right? So it all depends on how much you've learned, how yep. much you've introspected yep. as to how useful you're going to be to your child. Yep. Because if you don't know what's driving you, you're not going to know what's driving your kid. And a lot of the work that I do is with parents who have emotionally very, very intense children. And so my it's a, it's kind of a gift for me. Like I love the work I do. It's really hard. And I love the work that I do. Um, it also keeps me honest mm -hmm. <laughs> because I have to practice it day in and day out. And then I come and tell my parents, like, okay, this is what I'm noticing for myself. This is what I'm seeing in you guys. Like, give this a try. See if this kind of thing works. Because, again, each individual child is going to have their own way of expressing things. Mm -hmm. And as the parent, you're the one closest to them yeah. and most likely to be able to recognize what's right. actually going on. Right. And if you know what you do mm -hmm. and what you've done mm -hmm. and what your tendencies mm -hmm. are, y your children are probably going to be in certain situations similar to you because yep. they will have learned <laughs> from, yep. they will have learned the rage, right? right? I yeah. mean, you know. It, or they'll have the same genes for the rage. Exactly. Like, my kid gets mad too. Yeah. We have the anger gene. Yeah. Like, and that's okay. That's well, not and a it, problem. I, I can see it having come down in mm -hmm. my family because yeah. my father was a rage Our family, but yep. Mm -hmm. Right? I yeah. mean, it's just oh, yeah. came oh, yeah. down. Yeah. And learning to not be afraid of it and yeah. not need to shove it down and know what to do with it. Right. And then come back and like, if you blew it, repair. Yeah. Make repair. Right. Like, exactly. let people know what you're going to do differently. Right. Talk to them about like, how can I make this up to you? Like, I blew it. So, Bethany, we're just about out of time. Really of course, are. I, I had no idea it was going to go that. It always it goes really fast, fast, but this went really fast. Really so fast. Um, I was going to ask you if you had any additional thoughts, but I don't have even time to ask you about that. <laughs> so, uh -huh. Okay, so, I do have a thought, though. I okay, do have go a ahead. Parents need to take care of themselves. They absolutely need to take care of themselves. If they are noticing their own emotions are heightened, they cannot do anything for their kids. So really coming back to what you need, what sort of fills your own bucket, you know, as the saying goes, if you need time alone, when you can take it, like in little tiny bits, the things that you need are the things that you need to attend to and make sure you're getting. Otherwise, you can't do what you need to do. So thank you so much for coming this on. This has been an was, absolute pleasure. Know, wasn't it? A I would like to invite myself back. I would like to invite you <laughs> to invite yourself back. <laughs> I'm, I'm invited back. Yes. I would Thank love you. that. I would love that. And if so you're in I. Vancouver, I bet we could figure out a way to do it. I would love to, through, honestly, on the because internet. there's so much that oh, there's parents, so much, so much access yeah. to information that parents don't have. I know. That would be really useful. I know. All right. So thank you for coming on the show. <laughs> sure. Blah, blah, blah. We're just zooming through the close yep. of this. Um, it, it The work you do is really important, though, and, and just thank you. And I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. My guest today has been Dr. Bethany Michelle, a registered psychologist in Vancouver, British Columbia. I'm Candace Michelle, and this is our community. <music>